hey everybody, welcome back to Board Game Blender. I am Z Garcia. Today we are talking about sequels and spin-offs to other games. And this is an interesting trend, a trend that has continued to grow over the last few years. And I think it's a positive trend. I, I think it signifies growth in the industry, just like we see lots of sequels, lots of spin-offs in the film industry. Seeing that as a trend in board gaming lets us know that those things like theme, like mechanisms, you know, identifying with a game matters. And it matters to consumers, you know, matters to us when we see a game and we go, ooh, that's based on this other thing. I want to check it out. I'm actually going to be talking a little bit more about that in my quirky game segment today, which is not going to be the typical uh, quirky game segment I, I tend to do. But check that out, you know, a little bit later. And that's it. So let's dive right in. Let's hear about some sequels, hear about some spin-offs. Enjoy the show as always. Here we go. Hi, everybody. So, Broom Service the Card Game. This game took a unique journey to existence because it actually started off as Witches Brew the Card Game, which was then reimagined into the Kenner Spiel award-winning Broom Service the Board Game, which was then re reimagined into Broom Service the Card Game. So this is a card game based on a board game, which was based on a card game. Were you following along with me there? Well, let's take a look at how Broom Service the Card Game brews up its magic. Mechanically, Broom Service the Card Game is really simple. The deck is prepped by player count, and then each player gets dealt their own mini deck of cards. Here I've got a three-player game set up, so each person gets 17 cards. Players also draft a starting card for their tableau. A player's entire deck is available to them to select three cards from to play in a round. The only requirement is each card must be different from the other. Then, the lead player selects a card from their hand and chooses to play it bravely or cowardly. The brave side has three potions and the cowardly side has just one. The following players must play a card matching the lead card if they have it in their hand or pass if they do not. And passing is actually kind of a good thing because it kind of increases the chance that they'll have an easier play later. If a player, any player, chooses cowardly, they're guaranteed to collect that card for their tableau, but they'll only get one potion but there can only be one brave player in each play. So if Adrian plays a brown brave witch, but Brittany follows by playing a brown witch bravely also, then Adrian's card goes back to her deck for a future round. And this is really the heart of the game. You know how many of each card is in the game, and you know what you and your opponents are collecting. So you're really calculating the odds of a card being in someone's hand, along with trying to figure out exactly how your opponents think and what choices they'll make. Furthermore, there will be three random goal cards in each game. When a player's tableau meets all the conditions on a goal card, they get to take it for a five point bonus. These aren't actually easy to achieve, but five points in this game is a nice boost. The game is played in four quick rounds and the score is based on the goal cards collected, plus the number of potions in each color in your tableau. If I have one nitpick about Broom Service the card game, it's that I wish they hadn't used mini cards. Larger format cards would make it much easier to see the goal cards and the opponent's tableaus from across the table. But for what is essentially a third take on the idea of a brave and cowardly card play, Broom Service the card game stands on its own in a collection. So there you have it, Broom Service the Card Game. I have to admit, when I first read the rules to the game, I didn't understand where the game was. The rules were so simple, but then I got it to the table and it just sang. There is so much tension and energy in playing the odds and trying to outguess what your opponents are going to do. And some of the most fun moments in the game are when somebody is hemming and hawing about whether they should go brave or cowardly and they choose cowardly. And then you go around the table and it turns out they could have gone brave after all and gotten the extra potions. And then there's yelling and moaning and groaning and laughter. And it's incredibly fun. Uh, the game has fabulous art from the enormously talented Vincent Dutre. And the game scales incredibly well, especially between that four and six player count. So it's a nice portable package when you don't quite know how many people are going to be at the table. It's easy to teach, quick to play, and a ton of fun Broom Service the Card Game, check it out. See you next time.
Hello folks, Mark here, and welcome to Thinking Inside the Box. In this series, I'm focusing on inserts, storage solutions, and games that already do both really well. Today, we're taking a look at Codenames and Codenames Pictures, along with the insert from Broken Token. I'm pretty sure most of you are already familiar with Codenames, but Codenames Pictures differs from the original. Agents are no longer represented by a single word, but by an image that contains multiple elements. I realize just how incredibly popular the original is, but for me, Pictures is by far my favorite of the series. I love the artwork and how it allows for more subjective clues, breathing new life into the game. If you haven't already, give this one a closer look. Now, with both versions in hand, I was looking for a solution to combine everything into one box. Yes, I know, I could just throw it all in one box with bags, but the Broken Token has a better solution. And as I've said before, I do love a well-organized game box. This insert has many things going for it. I know one of the downsides for many folks is the cost of inserts in general, but this one is very affordable and it includes a promo card that you can add to the game. One side shows a dice tower, and the other side shows a version of the Broken Token logo, which is a big plus to have a promo with an insert, which is unusual. The insert allows you to combine two versions of codenames into one box. I don't own a copy, but I think there is a real obvious argument for keeping codenames After Dark separate from these family-friendly versions. The insert fits well into either the codenames or the codenames picture box and includes six adjustable dividers. In my setup, I used all but two of the dividers, so there are multiple ways you can divide up the cards. Now, unlike the foam core insert we looked at last time, this one does require some assembly. The provided instruction sheet is clear and concise. Glue can be used on any loose joints. I prefer using a CA with a quick activator. A couple other things you will need, an X-Acto knife and a small piece of sandpaper to clean up the edges after punching them out. And finally, a rubber mallet to tap those joints together. So here's a quick look at the construction. This one was a really quick build. Total construction time, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. The Broken Token has done a great job with this insert and optimizing space in a small box. A very affordable solution, and it makes the setup and takedown a breeze. And if you're a big fan of Codenames, make sure you give pictures a look. I really enjoy it. All right, folks, thanks for watching, and until next time, we'll see you at the table. friends of the blend and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Today we're talking about sequels and spin-offs. I'm going to be talking a little bit about reimagining themes to games. Now the game I'm going to be talking about is Witch Witch, which was published in 1970. Now they rethemed this game in 1985 and they called it Ghost Castle. Well, here I have The Real Ghostbusters published in 1986 which is a sort of a reimagining of those two games that I just mentioned. This is a two to four player game in which you're trying to capture barren bones. Let me set this up and show you how it works. So this is what the game board will look like set up. There's two sections here and then there's another two sections here. So for example's sake we'll just talk about these sections right here. Now every player is going to pick a pawn and put it on the X here to start. You're going to roll a six-sided dice and move in clockwise direction as many pips as you have. Now if you land on an empty square, that means you drop this playing piece, barren bones, down the ghost trap there. Now if at any time any player is standing in a red splotches along the game board, those are danger zones. The traps might hit you. 
Like for example, there's a trap right here, which is an axe. There is a trap right here, which is the wobbly bridge. A trap over here, which is the stairwell. A trap here, which is the ghost that will knock you over. So if at any time you are in those traps and you get hit and knocked over, you have to give up a ghost card. Now to obtain a ghost card, you would have to spin the spinner and just do exactly what it says. There's two spaces where you catch a ghost, one space where you lose a ghost, and one space where you've been slimed, and I'll get to that in a second. So, after you drop the skull, then you'll spin the spinner and do whatever it says. Now to advance to the next section, to section two, you will need at least one ghost card. To advance to section three, you will need at least two ghost cards. And then to advance to section four, and particularly climbing up the stairs to end the game, you will need four ghost cards to do that. Now when your playing piece lands on a zap space, which is this cloud with the lightning bolt comes out of it, that means that you get to steal a card from another player. If you have a You've Been Slime card, when a play, another player lands on a lightning bolt, you do not have to give up that ghost card. You would just give up this You've Been Slime card. And on the same token, if you are ever knocked over on these red splotches, you have to give up a card. But again, if you have a You've Been Slime card, just turn this back in and you don't have to give up the card. After you have four of these ghost cards and you're on the other side of the board, you can go ahead and start making your trek up the staircase here to the final spot and you are just going to land on this. You don't have to land by exact count, but just hit that to close the ghost trap and you have captured Baron Bones. You have just won the game. Now what I like about this game is just the total randomness from the spinner when you spin to dropping Baron Bones down the trap and you don't know which section it's going to land. Now for some people, they might say that, oh, this game didn't stand the test of time. But man, sometimes you just need to play something simple. Even maybe pull it out for the kids every once in a while. Well, that's all the time I have for now. May your rolls be high. Hello, welcome to Boards and Crafts, a place for quick tutorials of snacks and crafts inspired from games, for games, and all about board games. Forbidden Desert is a game that is based off of Game Rights' original game, Forbidden Island. In both of these games, you are fighting with your friends against Mother Nature with a couple plot twists in order to make each game very unique and just a little bit more fun. So today I thought that it'd be fun to be fantastic and create a Forbidden Dessert. You will need a box of chocolate cake mix, and depending on which box you get depends on what you will need of the following. For mine, I needed one and a fourth cup of water, three eggs, and a half cup of vegetable oil. To top it off after we get done with the cake, you will need vanilla icing and cinnamon sugar graham crackers, and also a gallon sized storage bag. You will also need some silver scrapbook paper, a set of toothpicks, a pair of scissors, a pencil, and hot glue gun to decorate after we get done with the cake. Depending on what the directions are on your box will depend on how you actually will bake the cake. For mine, I needed to preheat the oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. I then greased the bottom and sides of a pan. I mixed together the cake mix, the water, oil, and eggs in a large bowl with a mixer on medium speed. After that was done and it was a smooth mix, I poured it into a pan. And depending on the cake pan that you pick, it will change how much it should cook for and how long it should be. So for mine, I used an egg inch square pan and filled it all the way up so that we could have a little bit of a layer to cut off for, to create sand dunes later. After it baked for about 40 minutes I took it out and used this toothpick and inserted it in the center to see if it actually um, was baked fully. If the toothpick comes out clean it is baked. So you let it cool. This will usually take about 10 more minutes and we cut off the piece of the top part off that made it the cake a little bit more squared and placed it to the side. We cut off a little bit of the top to place it back onto the top of the cake in order to create a cute little sand dune. After you get done rearranging the cake toppings, you're then able to frost the top of the cake. What you're going to do now is put the graham crackers into a bag and crush them all up and then after you get it to where it is a fine 
crushed up looking almost like sin, you will place that onto the onto the frosting that's on top of the cake. Use the pencil to draw the gears out of the scrapbook paper and use the hot glue gun to attach the toothpicks to the paper. Place these on top of the cake for decorations and any other little tidbit things that you want to do in order to make it look like a forbidden dessert. And that's it! If you guys have any ideas for tasty treats or creative crafts inspired by any of the board games mentioned in this video, comment below or tweet them at me at rcrobot. Also, a quick shout out to my friend who helped me make this cake while everything was being crazy hectic. So I really appreciate that and had to mention that real quick. So thank you guys so much for watching and I hope that you have a very fantastic day. Bye! Hey everyone, Garbage Saku here with the Splitting Cardboard segment. Because this week's subject is about sequels and spin-offs, I like to talk about all that is Love Letter. Instead of giving the brief introduction of the main game itself, I wanted to explain all the other games within the Love Letter family. So here is the Garbage Saku's brief and not so complete guide to Love Letter. Love Letter debuted in 2012 and was designed by Seiji Kanai. It got its US release with AEG and had some art changes. Soon after, AEG put out some re-themed versions of the exact same game. Loot Letter with a Munchkin theme, Legend of the Five Rings, a Christmas version, and even the same first Japanese version. Later, some more re-themed versions got released but with some minor changes with the rules. Batman Love Letter have you earning points by punching villains. The Hobbit introducing splitting barons and zero cards. There's also a Star Wars version, but it's not released here. And on a recent discovery, Love Craft Letter, so far a Japan-only version, I believe has to do with Love Letter Monsters and Sanity. Love Letter Premium Edition, an upgraded form to the Love Letter we know, at 16 cards, 10 which are different and new, has bigger cards and plays up to 8 players. This full set will be out by the end of the year. A year after the first Love Letter, Kanai-san created a sequel to Love Letter called Lost Legacy. It uses the same engine as its predecessors but with an overhaul of the rules. The first title of the same name debuted in 2013 which also contains a second set, The Flying Garden, an extra game which uses the same mechanisms but with different cards. It was followed with two more twin packs and then AEG started publishing the game in the US. The first two games were split and the rest were in double packs. Again, AEG changed the artwork for its release, which in my opinion, I would rather have the original artwork. There is also a small release, Orb of Prophecy, which can only be obtained through a special event. And there is a Lost Legacies version that has, count it, 9 different sets. 9 different sets from 9 different Japanese designers. Unfortunately, it's only in Japan. Well, that does it for Love Letter. So, play Love Letter today. Hey, Ben here with another episode of How To Fun, a show in which we look at a board game and ways in which you can make it even more fun for you and your friends. This week, the uh, topic is sequels and spin-offs. So what I've decided to do is maybe follow uh, the cult, cult of the new here. And today we're going to be talking about none other than Pandemic Reign of Cthulhu. For those of you familiar with the regular pandemic, you will find quite a few similarities with Reign of Cthulhu. Your job is to move around the board, both collecting clue cards and keeping the cultists at bay. Once five cards of a particular part of town are collected, you may seal the corresponding gate. You may also use these gates and some powerful relics, but it may come at the expense of your sanity. While you are so doing, cultists will attempt summonings and the Shogoths will sacrifice themselves to the gates all in an effort to awaken Cthulhu. Stay sane and close all four gates before time runs out, or Cthulhu awakens, and you win. Oh Cthulhu, how I have a love-hate relationship with you. I love you because you make a wonderful theme for many great board games. There's Eldritch Horror, Arkham Horror, uh, it's Elder Sign, let's see, Mansions of Madness. Um, for goodness sake, there's Cthulhu Wars. But on the other hand, you are a theme that is very, very difficult to explain to people outside of the board gaming hobby. 
Um, I find this an issue because Pandemic is a gateway game, a wonderful game to play with people who you want to introduce to the hobby. Uh, I actually own the original Pandemic and decided to sell it because all my friends already had a copy. So I thought, hey, you know, I'll invest that money in something different. Well, I decided to invest the money in, well, this version of Pandemic. But now my issue is, in order to help people have fun, do I need to adequately be able to explain to them the Cthulhu uh, backstory written by H. Creed Lovecraft? So let's go ahead and look at maybe a couple of ways that you can try and explain Cthulhu to your friends before playing this game or any other Cthulhu-themed game with them. You know, he's got these tentacle things, big bat wings, he's big and green. Cthulhu? He's this big, bad, great old one, makes you go insane. What? What in the heck is a great old one? Ooh, that's an excellent question. Hmm. I'm pretty sure he's the bigger, more scary brother of uh, Davy Jones from that pirate movie. Come with me and I will show you. And when all else fails, you can always refer to the Urban Dictionary. A character in Lovecraft's tale, The Call of Cthulhu. Cthulhu is a monstrous entity who lives dead but dreaming in the city of Rolais, a place of non-Euclidean madness, presently and mercifully sunken below the depths of the Pacific Ocean. Cthulhu appears in various monstrous and demonic forms in early myths of the human race. Racial memory preserves him as humanity's most basic nightmare. Cthulhu is the high priest of the Great Old Ones, unnatural alien beings who ruled the earth before humanity formed, worshipped as gods by some misguided people. It is said that they will return, causing worldwide insanity and mindless violence before finally displacing humanity forever. So, uh, you want to play? So as you can see, describing Cthulhu may not be the easiest thing, well for me it's not at least, but the good news is that's okay. Uh, it's not necessary to understand Cthulhu or any of its backstory to enjoy this game. It's based on the pandemic system, one that's tested and tried and has proven to be a wonderful game time and time again. Will understanding Cthulhu and its theme make the game more enjoyable for people? Sure, I, you know, I'm sure it will. But in the end, is it necessary? No, no it's not. So my advice, give it your best shot. Try to explain it to them, but Play the game regardless. You'll love it, they'll love it. Uh, but how do you describe Cthulhu when you teach a new friend uh, any of these Cthulhu-themed games that are out there? Go ahead and tell me in the comments below. Also, I'd love it if you'd check out my Facebook page. It's How To Fun Gaming. Give it a like. And in the end, it's all about the games, right? So keep having fun gaming. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, Tiff here. This week is all about the spin-offs. So I took a look at my shelves for variants and sequels, and I found a bunch of Carcassones, a couple of Suros, but nothing stands out more on the shelf than a bright yellow box, and I have a ton of those. Haba makes some amazing games for kids, but I think Animal Upon Animal is by far the most popular one for my middle school board gamers. It's popular enough that there are a few spin-offs, so let's look at two, Balancing Bridge, and here we turn. Animal Upon Animal Balancing Bridge is a variant of the original Animal Upon Animal published in 2011. Like the original, it's a stacking game that uses dice to determine which animal pieces you have to stack on your turn. In this version, there are some new, bigger animals to stack, and the starting crocodile is placed on a hanging bridge inside the box. The die you roll has faces that correspond to the different regions of the box. So if you roll a sun symbol, that means you'll stack a piece from the desert valley. A leaf symbol means you'll take from the jungle, and so on. The biggest twist in Balancing Bridge is the addition of assignment cards. These add a set collection element that encourages some riskier stacking practices. Each card depicts a certain combination of animals, and once you get that combination touching in the animal pyramid, you score the card. If you knock over the animal pyramid when you're stacking, your turn ends and you draw an additional assignment card as a penalty. And you want to avoid this because the first person to score all of their assignment cards wins the game. Animal Upon Animal Here We Turn was published the year after Balancing Bridge in 2012. This version of the game features a unique, arrow-shaped board that sits on a wooden disc and must be rotated each time you stack a piece, all while you imitate the animal the arrow is pointing to. 
The die rolling is much the same as the original game, but there are die faces that force you to turn the board two spaces or even rotate it a full 360 degrees after you stack. You can also roll a shark's fin that allows you to change the direction that the board turns. Just like original Animal Upon Animal, in this version if you knock over the animal pyramid, you'll take additional animals to stack, and the first person to stack all of their animal pieces wins. If all of that seems easy, Here We Turn also comes with a hemisphere-shaped piece that makes the board wobble as you turn it. They call it the wavy variation for professionals, and that's no joke. It's the perfect selection if you're looking for a really hard version of Animal Upon Animal. I still have kids who enjoy plain vanilla Animal Upon Animal. I mean, you can't go too wrong with stacking games. The inherent fun of stacking things and waiting for them to topple is undeniable, but it is nice to have some variety. What I like about Balancing Bridge and Here We Turn is that they both add new and interesting elements to an already great game, but they do so without increasing the complexity. Every board game club needs a few games with short, intuitive rules that kids can teach to each other without adult help, and both of these games fit the bill for that. Spin-offs in general work well for kids because they feel more comfortable jumping into a game that's based on something familiar. I hope you check some of these out, and I'll see you back next time. There you are. I'm bored. <laughs> Hi there, sweet princess. No, my love, you are not bored. You've got so much to play with. I am. I am bored. Yes, but don't you like what Klaus Jürgen did with our city? Ah, uh, I guess. He built inns and cathedrals. We build and we dig. We're trading with goods and you have your own pig. A fairy, volcanoes, you wanted a dragon A river, a tower, a mayor, a wagon He jumped the shark with a weird catapult But made a new river, we gave you the cult A wheel of fortune, abbeys and bridges Castles, bazaars and mages and witches Shepherds and wolves and hills and sheeples Tunnels and fairies and shiny new meeples The Cathars, a count, a scout and a king Robbers and plagues and a crop circle thing. Phantoms and festivals will never be done. The sky is the limit for Garcasson. I'm still bored. I want something different. I want something new. Sure, my love, sure. But Klaus Jürgen did so much more than expand the city. He reinvented it. Klaus Jürgen Breda gave us in 2002. Hunters and gatherers, but not enough for you. The Ark of the Covenant, you think it's easy, huh? Well, how about the castle, designed with Rhinoclesia? Mayflower showed us what the new world was based on. The pilgrims were born in Carcassonne. The city is great, our kids are playing too. Wordplay is your thing, I have Carcassonne for you. He went around the world, started in the South Seas. The gold rush tents turned us into thieves. Over hill and dale and hunt, you know KG is never done. The sky is not the limit for Carcassonne. No! I want something different. Something new! Zombie monks, Cthulhu robbers, super knights that fly. Doomsday doctor time machines on all the end is nigh. Settle on those bloody raging mystic terror tiles. Rolling for imperial farmer steampunk wonder style. Vanilla flavored worker placement farmers and their son. Deep fried maple syrup, crispy bacon carcassonne. The future is here, let me tell you what I see. We're ripping tiles and calling it carcassonne legacy. to another segment of Real Talk with Sam. Thanks for being a friend of The Blend. We certainly do appreciate it. This episode, we're talking about sequels and spinoffs. And I got four games that came directly to mind as I thought about what games are good spinoffs and good sequels to their predecessors. So without further ado, let's get to it. 
The first one here that I've been wanting to talk to you about as far as being a successor or a sequel, not really, but it stays in the same line. Seven Wonders Duel. I consider this a sequel because the two player rules that came in uh, Seven Wonders, nah, not very good at all. And uh, I really like the game a lot. I love Seven Wonders. It's not innovative, but it was good. And uh, I love this two player version of it, that Mahjong mechanic. I know it's not really that, but that's what I call it, where you take a card and that re releases or reveals uh, two new cards or the cards that were underneath it. Uh, I just love how that simulated so well for two players, that card drafting mechanic that Seven Wonders really relies upon. Uh, so I had to talk about Seven Wonders Duel. If you haven't tried this yet, you need to, people. Now, the next one that immediately came to mind was this big fellow right here, Xenoshift Dreadmire, the successor to Xenoshift Onslaught, the original version of Xenoshift. This brings a lot with it. The gameplay is basically still the same. Uh, they don't throw any curveballs at you, but they do throw in some new mechanisms, some new rules that uh, really enrich the play that uh, you found in Xenoshift Onslaught. If you thought Onslaught was hard, <laughs> <laughs> Come check out our <laughs> Dreadmire because boy, oh boy, does it smack you around and then leave you uh, basically wanting more. Uh, so this is a really neat game. Go try it out as soon as you can. Xenoshift Dreadmire. Now, another one that came to mind was... Uh, uh, Two games that I really like for different reasons. One of them I like for its familiness, its family friendliness, its ease of play, its gateway ability. And the other one I like because it's meaner, it's tougher, it's more strategic, it's more tactical, a little bit more of the gamer's version of the original game. And that is this guy right here, King of New York. Now, King of Tokyo is a game that I've always liked a lot. Love rolling the dice, big chunky dice. Love all the gameplay. This simply adds more to that. Um, it's more strategic, it's more cutthroat, it's uh, just more <laughs> of a really good thing. So if you haven't tried King of New York, I would definitely give it a try, but don't expect necessarily the family friendliness that King of Tokyo has with it, because this one's a little bit meaner, might not be as friendly for your family, but that's the only thing that's keeping it. If you have a cutthroat family, go for it. And I'm sorry. And then finally, the one that came to mind now, uh, this one was not really a successor to the original game, but it definitely has the same theme, the same uh, everything about it, and it's a dice game. And that's what really brought me to this one, not to mention the artwork in Discoveries. Vincent Dutrait uh, knocks this one out of the park as far as artwork is concerned, and the mechanics are amazing as well. Now, it's, it's a lot lighter than its predecessor. Um, it's a lot uh, more simple than its predecessor, and that's probably why some people won't like it because the people who do like Lewis and Clark are the ones that will like Lewis and Clark and not necessarily like this game. However, I didn't really care for Lewis and Clark very much, but I really like historically thematic games. So when I saw this one, I was like, ooh, hoo, hoo. and we tried it out. Love the dice rolling mechanic. Love how you can take other people's dice and use them. Uh, but if they call their dice back, you lose them. So it is a little bit of a pressure. It's a little bit of a pressure luck mechanic there, but uh, really love the artwork. The uh, and I think it does capture the theme very well. So I consider this a successor or sequel to Lewis and Clark. And that's why I'm including it here. But hey, look. Now I, I may have said some things that won't sit well with some of you. Now look, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to keep it real. See you on the flip side. Sadness beckons me. I reject your happiness. They're dead. Now I win. Howdy, folks. I'm Agricola. I was born in 2007 and I play one to five players, about 30 minutes of playtime per player.
And I'm Caverna. I came out in 2013. I play one to seven players while keeping that 30 minutes per player playtime. Ooh, I sure am hungry. Oh, uh, okay. Um, both of both of the games are worker placement games with a farming theme built on top of them, but they definitely have their differences. Agricola has cards. Uh, you can draft. Sometimes you can take it and draft those cards or not draft them, and use those cards throughout the game to build improvements and things like that. While Caverna has no cards other than a couple of little cheat sheets that help you along the way. Okay, but Caverna also has caves, and they have ca that's where the Caverna comes from. They have cave mining, where you can mine for ore and gems, and you can build buildings in there while keeping the farming and animal theme of Agricola. So it's kind of a another layer on top of that as well. Mm -hmm. On top of all that, Caverna also has quests with dwarves. Look at these. These are dwarves. Can you believe it? They're dwarves. They go on quests. Not only are they workers, but you can give, armor them up, give them weapons, and send them on expeditions. So that's on top of what Agricola does for us. Um, Agricola is a lot tighter with the uh, feeding of your people. Uh, you <laughs> Sheep. You ate Rosenberg games. I have a, a lot of them have the theme of feeding your people. In Agricola, it's much more difficult. Caverna is more of an open game where it's easier to feed your people, and it's also more open in the game itself. You can be more, uh, you can focus in on one area, whereas Agricola, you won't have to be diverse and kind of do a little bit of everything. It's true. The components. Love the components of Caverna. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have a nice little broken token thing to show off our components. Here's all the lovely components. They have they have Anna meeples and vegetables and grain and, and nice pretty little rubies. And it's a really cool... Um, the components are amazing for, for Caverna. And the broken token makes it much easier to set up and to play the game as well. Mm -hmm. So what do you like about the game? Mm -hmm. Oh, you. Uh, she she particularly likes the sending the dwarves out and arming them up and, and sending them on expeditions to get various items. Well, I like building up your area, and when you're done, you have this cool, all these animals and all these farming and caves and all cool stuff in front of you. So there you have it. Uh, the two, For two players, there's not much difference. The only thing you do is you skip one of the rounds, and the boards are different depending on the number of players. Also, I want to mention that this is set up for the inductory game. You can flip the board over, and there's more uh, buildings that you can build on the back in the more complex mm -hmm. game. Yes. So, if you're interested in a more difficult game, then um, you probably want to try Agricola out. Try me out. If you like a little more open game that's a little bit lighter, definitely check out Caverna over here. So, thank you so much for watching. Thank you, people! Yes. Hey, hey, everybody. For today's Quirky Game, I actually wanted to talk about more of a concept, just some, some thoughts I've been having instead of a specific game. And, and that thought is how it compares in, in uh, consumers' minds the idea of a second edition versus a spin-off. You know, a something, the dice game, for example, or a reissue of a game, and how all those things sort of affect us and... and if we feel okay to buy something, if we think it's a good idea from the company's point of view, all those concepts. And sometimes these uh, discussions will, will pop up online with very different points of view. You know, people saying this game is the same as this other game, it's a ripoff. And people saying no, it's using the same concepts, but it's its own thing. I just find that whole thing to be very interesting. So, for example, let's start off here with Nations the dice game. Nations the dice game is very different from Nations. And so I don't think anyone is going to have the feeling of I got burnt by buying Nations the dice game since I already had Nations. That's not going to be an issue. In fact, if anything, I think Nations the dice game here is so different from Nations that they might appeal to completely different um, uh, di you know, demographics, and so I find that that possibly to be an issue for folks. You know, if you had this first, let's say, and then you see Nations on a shelf somewhere and go, ooh, I'm going to buy that, 
You might hate it. It's, this, it's a big, epic game. This is not that at all, really. And so that's, that's sort of an issue that I see companies having sometimes. But it does not bother me, really, when... You know, if folks put in a little bit of that uh, discovery time to realize that, you know, one says 30 minutes on the cover and the other one says two to three hours, then you kind of know what you're getting, you know. You got to do a little bit of the research. Now, here's another thing that happens where you have something like this, Fury of Dracula here, and it gets reissued. In this case, a third edition of the game. Uh, there was uh, obviously a first and a second edition. Second edition was out of print for some time before they came out with a third edition. And so in that case, I don't think it's a problem. You know, this is the one that's available now. It's been reissued. And if you want Fury of Dracula, this is the one to get. Now they do change, uh, sometimes drastically, from edition to edition. And if you were hoping for the way the game was when first or second came out, yeah, you're not really getting the same thing, and that's maybe unfortunate because you don't have access to it anymore. But at least it's not coming out on the heels of the last edition, which some companies uh, have been known to do, and I find that problematic myself. When a game comes out, you buy it, and then six months later, version 2.0 comes out, and it's streamlined, it's blah blah blah, it's ultimately better. But you bought the first one, and now you're stuck with the first version, or you pay again for the new, better one. Now, there's two camps of thought here. The people that say, don't whine about it. You got what you paid for. That's true. And then there's the people, and I land in this camp, that say, game publisher, either make sure it is not a beta test out of the gate, or then take enough time to really put out an extraordinary second version. You know, in six months, how much did you really learn? Or whatever it may be, a year, you know. Sometimes it just seems like they come out right on the heels of one another. And, and that's a trend I don't like. And then there's a final uh, thing I'm going to talk about here, which is uh, 51st State and Imperial Settlers. So here I have Imperial Settlers, which was based on 51st State. This came out, it was very different, and I think no one had any issue with this game is based on this other one, so I'm not going to buy it because it's so similar. They were very different games, really. And then 51st State Master Set came out, which went back to the original game and borrowed a considerable amount of ideas from Imperial Settlers here. And I know the uh, there's some division out there as to, you know, are these two games too close? Is it, uh, is one cannibalizing the other one too much, you know? And in this case, uh, I don't have a problem with it because I, I tend to, I mean, I do like the game a lot. I like both editions very much, but one is not the betterment of the other one. It's not that they are going, we're going to stop making this one and make the, the better one instead if you bought the, the previous one too bad for you. In this case, it is two games being both supported simultaneously that, yes, are sort of similar flavors, but you can pick and choose. And if you're insane like me, then you can have both. I, I love both of them. And if not, then you go with the one you like the most. You like the historical flavor, Imperial Settlers. You like the post-apocalyptic stuff, 51st state. You, you know, it depends which one, you know, if you read the rule book or you know about it a little bit, it depends which one you sort of gravitate towards. And that, I think, is not as problematic. I don't have an issue with a company supporting two lines of games that are similar, even very similar, as long as one is not sort of pushing the other one out, you know, and making you regret purchases you have made. So there you have it. Uh, that's it for me. Maybe I should have a Z Thinks segment. I'll see you next time.
one day, a great leader emerged among the scavengers of the Blight. Snag, a rat from the trash heap known as Dreadmound, intimidated and bested his fellows to secure his rule and form the Vermin Legion. Snag paid a surprise visit to the Great Vulture, Scarcrow, foul leader of the hunting birds. Scarcrow naturally tried to eat the fearless rat, but Snag stayed out of reach and made Scarcrow a most interesting proposition. The offer was simple, the birds would let Snag and his rats cross Minderfield to raid the mouse and shrew villages, and in return the rats would leave a tribute of captives for the birds to snack upon. Snag's boldness impressed Scarcrow. The lazy vulture enjoyed the prospect of an easy meal and so agreed to the rats' offer. The first raid, conducted in the wee hours of the morning, caught the sleeping mice completely by surprise. The rats ransacked the village of Nesterbrook, stealing precious food and supplies. They left poor Mrs. Redfern stealing her sleeping gown along with her daughter Sandria, bound and squeaking in the center of Minderfield. Scarcrow sent his best birds into the field to fetch the tasty morsels. Things looked dire for the Redferns. As the cruel birds streaked towards their prey, a beautiful blue jay swooped down with a defiant screech. On its back rolled a mouse clad in shining armor and wielding a deadly lance. The mysterious bear slammed into the other birds in a cloud of dust and feathers. While the jay fended off the enemy birds, the brave rider dismounted and scurried to rescue the captives. The day was saved, but the battle had only begun. Hearing of the defeat at the hands of the bird and rider, Scarcrow summoned Snag. He gave his best rook, Grizzard, to Snag and ordered them to exact revenge upon the mice. And so, what began as a raid grew into war. Many tail feathers fell, but many heroes and villains rose. Hello there. Uh, as you probably realized, we're talking about tail feathers. Uh, it's based on uh, Mice the Mystics universe and it's a spin-off uh, of that game. It continues the story of Mice and Mystics uh, where um, it is a two-player combat game where you have birds and rats and mice and they have war basically with each other. Uh, this game is compatible with Mice and Mystics or the other way, let's say you can take the Mice and Mystics miniatures and combine them with tail feathers. Uh, on the other hand, it's a standalone game, you can play it out of the box already, you don't have to combine anything. Uh, the game itself is story-driven, where you have different stories, continuations of stories, um, and you have campaign mode and such, you go through different scenarios and you fight each other. One player plays the rats, the other player plays the mice, which is really cool. Um, the uh, thematic part of this game is big. This is a very thematic game, uh, it brings up the universe of mice and mystics really well, but it's a fiddly on the other hand, because different thematic mechanics make it uh, like fiddly with different small parts that you need to know about different rules and such. Uh, but yeah, it's a small, a small caveat about the game. Now, uh, the game itself has a um, cool different flight system, uh, where you can tilt birds, tilting on left and right, which means uh, the bird will turn or left and right, but it's not like you turn 90 degrees or something like that. You have to turn smoothly uh, with the flight path tokens and such. The other cool thing is um, the leaves here are for drifting. So you can drift with the leaves uh, using this small rod here. Um, that way you can measure where the leaf will, will go. Like basically the wind blows the leaf and it drifts somewhere with a mouse or rat on, on the leaf, which is really cool uh, to transport um, ground troops by the air somewhere, which is re yeah really cool thing. Overall, uh, Tile Feathers is a um, very good two-player combat game um, with lots of uh, scenarios and I would say lots of replayability within one scenario as well. Uh, you have different commands that you take each turn and then you fight each other and it feels thematic, cool and if you, if you have the time for this small learning curve, let's say, not, let's say not small, but 
let's say, a little bit bigger learning curve with the mechanics and theme and such and small rules, uh, then you should definitely take a look at uh, the tail feathers. It's really challenging. It's a step up from Mice and Mystics. It's uh, more complicated, but on the other hand, it's very rewarding. So it's uh, tail feathers. And thank you for watching once again, and we'll see you probably in the next blender. Bye bye. Hey guys, it's Nerd E here with another Who Am I? Today's subject is sequels and spin-offs. The spin-off I wanted to talk to you about today is Twilight Squabble. So who am I? You know, where am I? I'm gonna answer those questions for you right now. Where am I? Well, Twilight Squabble is a spin-off of Twilight Struggle. I am not gonna get into the whole copyright infringement if there's any issues with that. I don't know who owns what. It's definitely a, a re-implementation of that idea in a much smaller box and a much smaller package. But what you're doing is basically trying to tug of war your way into being the controlling player, either it be the democratic United States or the communistic uh, USSR, and to the end of the game have the most either military power or if it's a neutral military, then have the most space um, technology, uh, win the space race, and pretty much you're playing cards. You're gonna go through a couple of eras and you're gonna try and outsmart your opponent. Um, that's really how it works. Okay, I told you where I am. Now, who am I? Well, in this game, you are the democratic United States, or you are the communistic USSR over a number of years, over decades. Um, to be, to who I am, I'm not really a person, I'm not really a character, I'm just kind of playing cards like I am just the superpower itself, taking the roles combined of JFK and Ronald Reagan or Gorbachev and all the different big players in that, and just kind of being the god of the USA or, or the USSR. Um, does that work? Let's find out. Okay, how am I? I? I don't feel like I am controlling the USSR completely. I, I'm just playing cards down, putting down cubes. Um, I really don't feel like I'm the USA. I don't feel like I'm tear down that wall. I'm not, not Reagan. Uh, I'm not any of those things. I'm not Gorbachev. What I am and what I feel like I am in this game, um, if you've seen Rocky IV and you've seen the Rocky versus Ivan Drago fight, I feel like I'm doing that. It's a very tight, combined um, snapshot of what the democracy and communism um, fight was. And I think I'm going round by round, throwing punches back and forth to see who's on top. Uh, that's what I feel like. So. Um, I, I, I tell you, you need to, to watch Rocky IV, uh, probably just the final fight. It might take as long to watch that fight as it does to play this game. You'll get the same thing out of it. And of course, that's how I feel I am in this game. I'm not throwing actual punches, but I feel like it's just that kind of back and forth. And I'm definitely not the USA or USSR. I'm just kind of a representation of it, kind of a comical representation almost in the way that I'm playing cards. So if he dies, he dies. And that's the way it has to go. Um, if the Russians win, Ivan Drago, he's going to, you know, be the machine to win the world but if you have faith in rocky rocky's always going to get back up rocky's going to survive and that's it guys thanks and that's it for us everybody thanks for tuning in as always a big thanks to my contributors who always do a great job and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks for the next episode of board game blender as always hey stay a friend of the blend i'll see you